Hi, I'm Gary Steerman, and I'm inviting you to the Homeward Bound Prophecy Conference, May 19th through 22nd, 2022. You'll be blessed and you'll want to be there because things are happening in this world right now that you need to know about. To register, see the number on your screen and give us a call or check our website, prophecywatchers.com. Join us. We'd love to see you. I'll be there too. <laughs> he will. Hi guys, welcome to another Monday night study. Tonight, what I wanted to do is just take a few minutes and go through a prophecy. Um, as you know, we've been looking at, and we're going to hit hard uh, in the coming year, which is actually next week. Um, start going through the prophecies and, and pulling the scriptures, the church father comments, and the Dead Sea Scrolls and try to pull them together and paint a good picture. So tonight what I wanted to do is go a look at Zechariah chapter 5. And uh, we're just going to look at that a little bit, look at some of the biblical concepts, some of the Hebrew words, and go forward from there. And I think it'll be really interesting. So let's go ahead and do that. And here is uh, Zechariah 5, and I'm using my um, e-sword, uh, but you can use anything. So this is the second part of it. The first vision is the vision of the flying scroll. And this one is the vision of the woman in the basket or in the ephah. So first, let's, let's just read it. It's just basically six verses. So <clears throat> it says, uh, to the angel who talked with me, went forth and said to me, lift up your eyes and see what it is that goes forth. So there's something that's going forth. This is a new vision. And also remember Zechariah, what happens was the Lord blessed him. And in one night he had eight separate dreams or eight separate visions. And they all have something to do with Israel back then. And they all have something to do with end time prophecy, um, according to the scrolls. And so we'll look at each one of these uh, sometime. But the last two specifically, the woman in the basket and the four horsemen, um, I, I believe have some interesting uh, points to Revelation. So anyway, let's look at this. So he said, he looks up and he sees something and he says in verse 6, I said, what is it? And he said, it is the ephah that goes forth. And he said, this is their form in all the earth. So there, whoever they are. Um, but there's an ephah. Now, an ephah is a basket. Uh, and it's a unit of weight, much like we would say a bushel basket is so much pounds or so much density of wheat or whatever it is we're saying. It's probably a little different depending on what you're selling. But it's basically like a pound of chocolate or a... Uh, cubic foot of something depending on how dense it is so the point is though actually the word ephah is an egyptian term but it becomes a normal measurement in this later so it's interesting that they use an ephah for symbolic purposes this is a foreign uh weight system okay egyptian you know and the second part of that is it's a weight system for selling things so it's some sort of a commercial type thing. Okay, so it, but it's basically think of it as a bushel basket. And it's their form in all the earth. So there's them, more than one person. There's, there's a group of people and they use commerce to control or make money or whatever uh, in all the earth, the way they do things. Uh, so we'll come back to that. Behold, a lead cover was lifted up, and a woman was sitting in the middle of the ephah. And he said, this is wickedness. And he cast it into the midst of the ephah, and he cast the lead stone cover uh, over its opening. And I think that's interesting. It's, lead, it's not just lead, but it's lead stone. So there's something to that. Anyway. I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, two women came out, <clears throat> and the wind was in their wings. So these women had wings, and they had wings like the wings of a stork. 
They lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heavens. So in other words, they didn't go straight up out of sight. They just flew up a little bit and then took off in some direction, and you could watch them as they go. So between the earth and the heavens. Um, and I said to the angel who talked with me, where are they taking the ephah? And he said to me to build a house for it in the land of Shinar. It shall be established and set there on its own base. And then he goes in the next chapter to the next vision. And we look at this and we think, what, what are we talking about here? So again, it, it's cryptic. It's a, it's a prophecy of a future time and a future event. First, let me kind of look at this. Let's take the very last verse first. So where are they taking this object? Okay. They're taking it to the land of Shinar. Now, if you go back into Genesis and look, Nimrod started building his kingdom, and it lists several cities in the land of Shinar. So the land of Shinar is an old biblical term for the land of Babylon. Now, connected with this, they just came back from Babylon, and hopefully they left their apostasy and their junk and the people that came back from Babylon, only about 50,000 out of the whole group. But these people were dedicated to the Lord, followed the Zadok priests, reestablished things the way they're supposed to. They got rid of the paganism. Uh, but in this case, it's not saying that they came back from Babylon and left their idolatry there. They're in Israel, and somehow from Israel, two things, uh, women, stork women, stork-winged women, uh, pick this up and take it to Babylon. And so why are they taking this object to Babylon? And it says, it shall be established and set forth on its own base. So they're taking this thing to establish something in Babylon. So first off, let me look at, explain this to you, this word for house. Let's see if we can do this. Let me just go to our... Um, Maybe I need, oh, I need to switch to a different version here. Okay, so the word for house is this word here. And if we go to Strong's, notice it can be a, a palace or a house. A house is where something lives. So a king's house is a palace. A priest house or a religious house is a temple. So notice one of the translations for this is temple. Okay, so let's go back to it guys using this version here so he said to me so where are they taking this ephah and he said to build a house or a temple for it if it's a false religion we'll, we'll get to that in a second in the land of shinar so this is actually a prophecy about mystery babylon in the end times and there's several things that connect it to build a house for it in the land of shinar it shall be established and set there on its own base. So two somethings are taking this ephah. And in this ephah is a woman called wickedness. Now, right here in verse 8, it says uh, this is wickedness. Now, the word for wickedness uh, can mean anything from murder to you know, any kind of very evil, very wicked type thing. But most of the time, it's specifically used for a prostitute, which is considered wickedness, so you're breaking the covenant. And if this was literal, they put a prostitute in a basket and put a lead cap on it and take her somewhere, you know. But this is symbolic. This is something that's uh, a, a part of a dream. And most cases, when you talk about a unfaithful woman or a prostitute, it's usually referring to Israel betraying the Lord. So the concept is that Israel and Judah are in a covenant with God, Jehovah, and now they're cheating on him. They're the wife, he's the husband, or wives and husband. They're cheating on him by going after false gods. So it's kind of that metaphor. Just as you would feel if you found out your wife is cheating on you, is the way God feels when Israel and Judah don't rely on him, and they go after some other god or something, or occultism, that kind of thing. So when you see this in here, we're talking about a woman who's wicked. 99% of the time, we're talking about a prostitute. That would be 
spiritually or symbolically connected to a false religion, okay, or someone who goes after false religion. So in this case, we have a woman that is a great harlot. She's going to the land of Babylon, and after a time, not right now, this is, they just came back, it's 537 BC or sometime thereafter. So maybe 400s, early 500s BC. But sometime later in time, there is going to be this harlot Babylonian mystery religion headquartered or established in its own set or its own base in Shinar and Babylon. So that part is really interesting. Um, so then the next part is in this uh so kind of starting over now that we've got those pieces uh there's this EFA, which is a commercial system so again there's commercial mystery babylon who does things with the nations um and that's their form in all the earth all the daughters of babylon or the pieces of this empire it's not an empire by force like a uh an uh, the Roman Empire by having their own army. This is controlling things by commerce, by ephahs. So they lifted up a lead cover, put the woman in the middle of the ephah, and put a lead on it, uh, a li lid on it, rather, and the lid is made of lead. And so that's definitely, in one sense, to keep her for a time yet future. But specifically, why lead? And where did we read it here just a second ago? It said, oh, here it is, a lead stone over its opening. Now, if we still have it, let me see if I have my, I'll just pull that up really quick. Okay, here's our metal chart. We were looking at this um, last week or so, and outlines of empires and stuff. So, we're most familiar with Daniel. And so Daniel has a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, uh, copper, belly, legs of iron, toes of feet and clay. And this is the image that he sees in or that's recorded in chapter two of Daniel. And it represents Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, and the Roman Empire. Well, there is this lead empire. When we go back to the Testament of Noah in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have the same kind of information, but there are these extra um, things, basically. There's a lead kingdom, a clay kingdom, then there's gold, silver, copper, and iron, and then there's lead again, and then there's clay. <clears throat> and that corresponds to the um, clay kingdom or of, of toes mixed with iron, but specifically this. And what we've done here on this chart is kind of went forward. We know very little of lead and clay, but we know that it's uh, Nimrod's Babylonian Empire. Uh, and lead I, apparently is a symbol for a uh, more of a religious empire than a army empire. Um, so I could force you by sending in the police or the military and incarcerating you and making you do something. Or I could possibly force you by simply not making sure you don't get any food, you don't go anywhere, and then you will quickly decide to follow directions. So I don't have to like pay a bunch of troops or whatever. So control by commerce uh, or religion, force you into my religion to do whatever, as long as part of the religion is tithing, that way, you know, I can make money. Uh, so I can use a government, force you to pay a tax or the religion for a tie or something like that, some sort of control. Anyway, then Pharaoh's Egypt, and then you've got Nebuchadnezzar's empire, which is different, but gold, silver, copper, and iron, and we see that all over. And then lead is not mentioned in Daniel because it's a side note. It's a religious system coming out of the Roman Empire somewhere later. It's a Babylonian mystery religion. And when the clay kingdom comes, it's ten toes, uh, the it, prophecies of Daniel and Revelation say the Antichrist takes over the ten toes, and they hate the mystery Babylon, the harlot. They destroy her, burn her with fire, and take her kingdom. So that's why this is not part of the Roman Empire 
you know, directly or the feet and toes of clay directly. It's its own thing. And so what we're seeing in here is the, the lead kingdom uh, really comes to be established between the Roman Empire and the Ten Toes, which is obvious because it's established because the Ten Toes seek to destroy her because she's already so powerful. So with the lead kingdom, we see Mystery Babylon. We see the lead Epha in Zechariah 5, which is what we're looking at now. And that's connected with the second Ezra prophecy of the dragon kingdoms and Gad's prophecy of the moon kingdom, which is the donkey and the camel. So it's really interesting. You've got a donkey and a camel, and then you've got two stork winged women that have something to do with creating a kingdom, a lead kingdom, a lead kingdom, a mystery Babylon kingdom, and a dragon nation kingdom all based on, heavily based on religion, as opposed to these others were heavily based on just control, a tyrant. Doesn't really matter what religion, just it's an empire. So anyway, showing you that just to go forward. So we're using the Testament of Noah from the Dead Sea Scrolls as an outline. And it's not finished yet, but it's pretty interesting to have these. The concept is that Israel is the plant of righteousness. It's an olive plant in a forest of other trees, just nations. And these empires, mountains of metal, come against the forest to destroy it because it wants to expand its empire, is the concept. And this is repeated over and over again. So we get to Daniel 2, and we have metal empires. It looks a little different. You get to Daniel 3, the empires become animals. And you've got a lion, a bear, a leopard, and an well, it's a nondescript beast in Daniel. Over in 2 Ezra, we see that it's actually an eagle. And it represents the Roman Empire. And so there's other connections. So we can go through and connect these really well, I think. So let me go back to that since we understand that. So there's some connections with the Lead Empire and Mystery Babylon in the Book of Gad. And then we're looking at Zechariah 5. And we're seeing a lot of the same things, lead with lead, two religious movements, camel and donkey, mystery Babylon, and dragon nations. So let me go back to where we were. Well, you didn't close it out. There we go. Okay, and it's lead stone. Uh, and so what I didn't show you, let me go back here for a second. I don't think I've got it listed in here. This is lead, and this one is lead stone if I remember correctly. Oh, I don't have it on here. It's in my notes in the book, or which will become a book eventually. Okay, so let's just go back to... Okay, no, wrong one. Okay, so let's look at this again. Just kind of reread it. The angel said, lift up your eyes and see what goes forth. And I said, what is it? He says, it's an ephah that goes forth, some sort of religious system that controls commerce. Okay. And he said, this is their form in all the earth. This religious system is probably been different religions connected with different empires. But the way that you can see it is that it controls through commerce, sometimes with the help of an army, because Mystery Babylon fornicates with kings but sometimes other ways, but it's always connected with buying and selling. That's their form in all the earth. And he said, behold, a lead cover was lifted up. So there's a bushel basket, a lead cover, and then there's a woman. The woman is sitting in the middle of the ephah. So the woman sitting in the ephah controlling commerce is wickedness or a false religious system. He said this is wickedness and he cast it into the midst of the ephah, so the wicked religion goes into the commerce basket, and he put a lead stone over its opening. So specifically, the metal that's connected with what we would call Mystery Babylon. I lifted up my eyes and behold and looked, two women came out. These are two religious movements because of them uniting together to take the system to Shinar, to establish it, put it in a temple, and get it ready to go, giving their force to it. We need to identify what these two religious systems are. 
then we can begin to identify what Mystery Babylon is. So these two women came out and they had wings, which means they could fly quickly and everything, but they weren't wings like an eagle or a good bird. It's actually an unclean bird, a stork. So it's some sort of something that looks good. They would look like angels with big wings, you know, really pretty women with really big wings, not a bat wing, but bird wings. But you have to be told it's stork wings. So don't be fooled. It looks good, but it's not. Okay. They had the wings of a stork. They lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heavens. And I said to the angel who talked with me, where are they taking the ephah? And it's to build a house for it or a temple for it to establish it in the land of Shinar or in Babylon. It shall be established sometime in the future. It's not now, but in, in his time period. And it will be set there upon its own base. That may or may not mean Babylon is the basis or the headquarters for the system. Just like if you talked about Roman Catholicism, the headquarters is Rome. For Islam, the headquarters would be Mecca. Uh, for the Anglican Church, I guess that would be, well, be somewhere in England, probably London. So you've got headquarters for each movement. This may or may not be headquartered in Babylon. It looks like it is, but at least it's going to be called Babylon. <coughs> So at this pace, at this point, we'll stop. And I just wanted to show you this. Let's see if I have, that's that. Let me, do I have, well, we've seen it on here. But the basic idea in the picture that I had was, and it's not too easy to see, but right here, we've got the lead ephah. So this is a, a bushel basket, or at least my graphic ability to draw a basket, uh, with lead on it. And then these two stork wings women. So again, you've got two sub movements creating mystery Babylon with lead. And you've got mystery Babylon and lead. And then the dragon nations apparently are part of something. And the moon kingdom in Gad, which is a false religious system that exists at the end of time that has to be destroyed by the second coming. And it consists of two religious movements, a camel and a donkey. So we, we're beginning to see the patterns arise. So we should be able to figure this out in the near future. Okay, so I just wanted to show you that. And it's a small study starting on this. So Zechariah chapter 5, I believe, points to mystery Babylon. It probably points to other things like heretical things going on back in their time too. But the Dead Sea Scrolls talk about the idea of all prophecy that has some sort of a bearing on end time prophecy was put in the canon. If it's a prophecy that's localized, that has nothing to do with end time prophecy, even if it was written by Isaiah or somebody, it was not put in the canon. That, that's their story. <clears throat> that may or may not be completely true, but that's the way they talk about it. So they agree that there are extra biblical end time prophecies. So we need to study the scrolls. But the idea is that there's nothing in the prophets that you would look at and say, oh, that was back then that has no bearing at all now. Well, it has some sort of a bearing. And I think that one is really, really specific. So we'll go ahead and stop there for our study for tonight. I just want you to kind of think about this. And then next week, we'll look at some others. So look at Daniel chapter 2 and get familiar with the metal kingdoms, gold, silver, copper, and iron and clay and those come back later on um if you have the testament of the patriarchs which is one that we wrote a uh, ways back the patriarchal fragments anyway out of that look at the testament of noah focus on the the metal empires to kingdoms the mountains that come against israel and the nations and see the similarities and look at zechariah chapter five the lead kingdom that's mystery Shinar or Mystery Babylon, Wickedness, and then the two stork ladies. And we'll come back to that at a later time. So now let me just go through um, the chat room and see if we have questions. Many of you have been praying for me because I have been sick. or In December, I got sick. And I just get this normal, I have a weak bronchial deal. So I'll catch some sort of virus, flu, COVID, whatever, you know, catch something. 
and it'll go away in a day or two because it's not a big deal per se. I have a really good immune system that way. But whenever I do that, half the time, if it's in the winter, I'll get a real weird bronchial kind of situation. And sometimes I've had the cough last like two months. That's the worst it's ever been. Totally healed fine, you know, within three or four days, everything goes away. No more sore throat or whatever. But the cough sticks around. So this last year, I've been hitting hard the D and the K and the vitamin C and the zinc and things like that. And when I got the cough, I started doing lots of hot drinks. And it's actually done pretty good. I think it's been about three weeks, maybe four. I don't know if it was back during. Yeah, I don't remember when it actually started, if it was the end of November or beginning of December. But anyway, three or four weeks, one month, and then I'm pretty much back to normal. I've only coughed like once or twice during this, so I'm doing real good. Uh, the other thing that I would like to do, I want to share these things with you on our regular uh, weekly uh, series. And if you have comments or questions, you can make comments or questions. And then um, what I would like to do eventually is to run it down. Like this was just a 20 minute deal. If I didn't repeat myself, I could probably make it 15 minutes and create small teaching sections and put on our app. When we go to our, this is our homepage. Let me refresh it. Oh, that's not good. Maybe I'm not broadcasting over there. I should be broadcasting over there. Oh, but I probably didn't set it up. Okay, anyway. Um, so when we go over to our uh, playlists, our videos, we have these. And I would like to uh, create like a, um, well, Dead Sea Scrolls and then prophecies in general, but like a curriculum and go through, like we've got some things with Gad the Seer, we'll end up doing that book in its entirety later, and then Testaments of Patriarchs, things like that. So these are our live streams, so we should have those coming through here. But we will eventually do that, and I'd like to create that kind of stuff. So basically, uh, and I was thinking of this the other day, starting with the idea of why we would use the scrolls, because there's a lot of denominations that would say, you're adding to scripture. So we need to identify the canons, uh, how many books were supposed to be in them. If we have that in extra biblical and history and church fathers and the, you know, the councils and uh, who said what and why and the concepts. So we can identify the 39 books, of the Old Testament, 27 books, of the New Testament, understand that they're closed. We don't add to either canon. We don't have one canon. We have two. If you think about it. There's an Old Testament and a New Testament. There's a lot of cool stuff in between the Testaments in that 400 silent years, but it's not to be added to the Old Testament or to the New Testament. It's, it's its own thing. It's just extra biblical stuff. And it talks about writings pre-Moses. So in a sense, that could be a pre-Mosaic canon if they even considered it that way. But either way, it's important, but it's not to be added to Moses canon. Moses canon is closed. New Testament is closed. When we get to the millennial kingdom, we might actually have uh, the two witnesses or somebody or Jesus even write the I told you so. This is how it was fulfilled. So there might actually be a millennial canon. Who knows? We'll have to wait and see. But either way, we don't add to scriptures. But to understand that, just like we'd look at Josephus and he mentioned a certain Roman general that did something, and that's how the prophecy was set up or, or something like that. Those kind of things are what we're doing, trying to identify who did what and when. And so going forward, and if they have extra biblical prophecies, most of which focus on the first coming, and they're accurate. So no matter how you do it, you've got to do something with it. So the first section in that ought to be, canons why we're not adding to scripture but why we're looking at history and the concepts between the pharisees sadducees and essenes briefly on that particular topic at least and then go forward with it we've got the prophecies in the old testament we've got the prophecies in the new testament new testament explains a lot okay and then but the images are based on the older manuscripts like the 
testaments. So then we have to get those completely understand the symbolism and then go forward. So we're living in exciting times. These symbolisms and the, um, the uh, theology of the Essenes and things like that have only been out available to the public in English anyway, uh, for about 22 years, something like that. Um, so it, it is still very new as far as a denomination to study it and change something. So this is an exciting time. The final Jubilee starts in 2025. So we have a couple of years to kind of get ready for things to happen. And I think by that time we need to have everything identified because the strongest way to witness is to say something will happen or an event will happen on a date or something. And then when that comes to pass, they come back and ask you, how did you know? It's because of the Bible. It's the strongest witnessing point. Well, I don't like to hear that I'm a sinner destined for hell. Well, the same book that said that told you this would happen and you stood there and you watched it happen. So what do you do with this? Something to think about. So very, very important. The Epistle of Barnabas from the first century talks about that. Use recently fulfilled prophecy from your time period to witness because it's the strongest witnessing part. And then know the way to lead someone to the Lord, which the, what he called, the system that he called, it's the same system we call the Romans Road, looking at those scriptures showing the basic plan of salvation. So anyway, just thought I would mention that. So those are some of the interesting things. So thank you for all your prayers. I'm like 99% back to normal. So I'm going to go ahead and say uh, good night to everybody. Uh, so God bless you, and we'll see you next Monday.